My name is Alice Prohaska. I'm the principal of Somerville College, which sponsors this lecture in memory of Monica Fuchs. The lecture has been endowed by her family. She struggled with depression and bipolar, and uh, so we honor her memory each year with this very special lecture, and it's a most particular honor to have David Nutt on this occasion. I'm going to invite Professor Guy Goodwin from the Department of Psychiatry to introduce David Nutt to all of you. Thanks, Alice. So thanks, Alice. That's, uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome David Nutt back to Oxford. Um, he's a friend of many of us who still work here. Uh, he himself trained originally in Cambridge um, and then did um, uh, his clinical training in London um, before seeing the light and coming to Oxford to work in David Graham Smith's lab. Uh, that's where many of us uh, who work on the problems that we're, we have common interest in met up and worked together in the 80s. And it was a great time to be young, as they say. Uh, since then, he's worked in the US. He had a time uh, in drug development and industry. And then he's been back in academia now for as long as I can remember, working first in Bristol and uh, subs latterly uh, at Imperial, uh, where he's a professor of psychiatry and psychopharmacology. So that's David's academic career. He's had fantastic success over that period of time. He's published massive numbers of pa highly cited papers. But of course, what makes him a household name is a completely different activity, which was his chairmanship of an advisory committee for the government. And I won't tell you the stories around that because he's probably going to tell you himself. But uh, that had meant that uh, he is now has 6,000 Twitter followers, so top that. David, you're very, very welcome. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be back, actually. It's the second time I've been in Oxford in the last two days because we had a, a memorial service to David Graham Smith on Saturday night in, uh, in Corpus. So it's a pity he can't be here. But he did, he was one of the first people to ask me to talk after I was sacked, because he'd sat on that committee himself, and uh, I think he was grateful he hadn't gone the same way. But, uh, so I did give this similar talk in Abingdon a couple of years ago for him, but I've obviously developed it and added to it since then. So just a little bit more about me for those of you who weren't listening to what Guy was saying. I'm a psychiatrist, about 30 years experience, as I like to say, with a name like Nut. There weren't many options. <laughs> the men in the audience know another one, but... Uh, I've been a researcher for about 30 years, and the period in Oxford was fantastic, and it's great to see the people here that taught me all I know, and you can blame them if I get it wrong, Phil. <laughs> um, I've had four children, touch wood, they're still alive, and um, they're almost through those formative years, which apparently go on till about 25 now. And of course, I'm an ex-government drugs advisor, which is why you've heard of me. And, uh, I just want to share this with you. So this was the lecture, the last time I gave a public lecture on this topic was this one, and I was sacked as soon as it was published. So <laughs> I'm not entirely sure, do you, I mean, probably just burn them at the stake here, do you, if I get it wrong? <laughs> so this is the, um, the cover of the Guardian Week, um, which uh, happened or came out uh, after I was sacked. And uh, it's, it's a rather effective caricature, not not only because it makes me look slim and makes me look like a doctor, I haven't got a white coat, I can reassure you, but the, there are two really important aspects of this. The first is the bottom left, the scales of justice. And that really encapsulates the debate. On the left-hand side, beer and fags, and on the right-hand side, stuff in plastic bags with a funny color. Now, I don't know what that is. Of course, one of the paradoxes is that no one knows what it is because we don't even find out what's being sold on the streets these days. But anyway, there is this tension between the, the old taxed drugs and the new recreational substances. And that's the book of cannabis falling from my hand. And, but the top left-hand corner is also very interesting. So my sacking coincided with Andre Agassi coming clean about the fact he had taken crystal meth, methyl amphetamine, when he was Wimbledon champion. And uh, that, he was tested positive for that, and that caused great consternation at the... Um, What's it called? The Wimbledon Lawn Tennis Association, I suspect. Um, because the laws at the time, and I think they still do, said it, the minimum was a two-year ban and maybe a life ban. Now, you can debate whether that would be a sensible or just uh, punishment for someone 
caught using a, a drug which probably wasn't helping his performance. But anyway, that was a reality at the time. And, and they, so the tennis authorities were confronted with a real tension, what to do. And they did what I suppose would, it was actually a very English thing. They decided to ask him to tell the truth. Uh, Andre, did you actually take crystal meth? No, of course not, he said, no. And they said, oh, great. Oh. <laughs> Go back and play some tennis and we'll, we'll, we'll lose the second sample. Uh, and of course, when he decided he needed some extra money, he wrote his autobiography, and I'm sure the, the person who wrote it for him said, we've got to get this out, because it's going to give you a couple more million sales, and it did. And that, as I say, summarizes the real tension with drugs. They're banned, they can destroy people's careers if, if, if um, people are caught taking them, and yet the p general public and the media really love them, because they sell uh, copy. And one of the reasons you have heard about me is that my sacking did polarize the media. So the, well, the, the uh, ramifications, um, reverberations continue. So the, the BBC were very supportive. The broadsheets were very supportive. And then there are these, I don't suppose you get them in Oxford, but there were these newspapers which um, took a different view. Um, the Sun has long called me Professor Poison. And my, um, she's not here, is she? Melanie's presumably. She's, <laughs> She's doing the moral maze tonight at 8 o'clock, so she probably isn't here, but um, she's my nemesis, or wants to be, and, and she said I was part of a manipulative, subversive, and lethally dangerous clique. Now, she is right, I have to own up, but the problem is I haven't found, yet found anyone else who's part of that clique, so <laughs> if you're here, you know, would you let me know afterwards, please? And Peter Hitchens, has he come? He lives in Oxford, doesn't he? Yeah. Are you here? No. Oh. <laughs> It's a pity, really, because he and I have had an interesting dialogue on the radio. We won't go into that. I tend to take private eye as a sort of the yardstick of rational media um, perspective, and I just thought this really sums it up. You know, one nutcase should be sacked, nut guilty must be reinstated. That's the, that's the right and the left of it all. However, given that Leveson has now started taking evidence, you might be interested to know what the, those newspapers did to me that week. I was uh, sitting in uh, Heathrow a w exactly a week after I'd been sacked, five o'clock on the Friday night. I got a phone call from a, a Sun journalist saying, we're going to do a two-page expose on three of your children's drug taking tomorrow. What do you say about that? And actually, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, so I just put the phone down, and then I rang the PCC and said, what can we do? And they said, well, there's not much you can do. Let's see what happens. And the PCC tried to stop it, but... They didn't succeed, and there was a two-page spread, and they claimed that my son, was using a, who was using a, smoking a roll-up, was actually using cannabis, and one of my daughters, who doesn't drink, was drunk, and they took a picture of my son, who'd come out of a sauna in Sweden, um, naked in the snow, and they thought that was, a, I guess, a legitimate criticism of my moral position, or my moral sort of um, behavior as, as a father. It was repeated in the mail and the news of the world, uh, the PCC actually did get the Sun to take it off their web page, but we never got it down from the mail. And when I said to them, you know, what can we do? And they said, well, you can't do anything because the editor of the mail, of course, as you all know, is the chair of the PCC. So, you know, you've... And that is why we need to do something about the PCC, because it's still up there telling untruths about my children. And what was quite interesting about that particular day, that particular expose, was that they... My children were not alone. They had the... They had Daniel Radcliffe on the other page. They had Daniel as Pot Harry Pothead. He was also filmed in a party with a roller. And they claimed he was smoking a spliff. And this is, this is one of the classic ways in which the media distorts the dialogue about drugs. Because if you smoke a roll-up, you're smoking a spliff. That may, I mean, maybe that's what the police do as well, I don't know. But just be warned, those of you who can't afford real cigarettes. It could have been worse, of course. It could have been they misunderstood his interaction with horses in a different way, but, but that's a rather subtle joke, and we won't go further there. And I won't show you any more of that picture, but you can get it online if you want. And the public response was very, very heartening. Uh, I got 30,000 supporters on a Facebook site they set up for me. 2,000 scientists, some of you in, in this room I know, signed a petition to Gordon Brown demanding my reinstatement. And, that didn't happen. Um, and there was a protest 
by the Students for a Sensible Drug Policy outside Downing Street. And as I say, it was very reassuring to, to know that some people actually did care about the, um, the active at the event. So I've had a couple of years now to reflect on why I was sacked. It, and it's not entirely clear. It probably won't be clear until Alan Johnson writes his memoirs, which hopefully sooner rather than later, so he can remember the truth. But anyway, they said I was, um, I was getting involved in policy, and all I said was that the policy wasn't evidence-based, as it was supposed to be. They said I was giving mixed messages. Uh, and I said, well, alcohol, the pharmacology of alcohol is similar to GHB and GBL, and so if alcohol was invented today, uh, it would probably be banned if you're going to ban those drugs. And those drugs were banned while I was chair of the ACMD. They said they'd lost confidence in me, which, of course, is political speak for uh, I'd lost confidence in my ability to toe the line. And they said I hadn't told them I was publishing the lecture I'd given earlier in the year. And uh, honestly, I still, to this day, cannot really understand why I should get permission to publish in a, an academic journal uh, a lecture that I give. So we'll have to just disagree on that one. But it, is the, it does raise the fundamental issue of how scientists interact with government if government really doesn't want to listen to what the scientists are saying. So I've thought in giving this lecture about how we can improve the situation. And there are four bullet points, which I'll talk each to, to each in turn, in, in relation to decision-making about drugs. And I think the first is to make sure people have the facts. And this new organization uh, I set up, the ISCD, Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs, is designed to tell the truth about drugs. You can go on the website and you can see what we as an expert group believe to be the facts. So here are some of the facts. It used to be that scientists did science and politicians did policy. And that was really sort of characterized by Winston Churchill's famous quote, scientists should be on tap, not on top. Um, and there was a distinction and a division between certainly scientists advising the government on drugs and policy until the last Labour government. And then we suddenly discovered that these politicians became scientists. And we had this statement, Gordon Brown made this statement, skunk is lethal. Um, soon after he took over the reins of power. And I still haven't worked out which of, the, which of those three words is wrong. Uh, certainly sk skunk isn't lethal. So either lethal means something different or skunk means something different in his mind. And then Jackie Smith said the ACMD had got it wrong on ecstasy and brain damage. And, um, and the ACMD was got it wrong on cannabis and schizophrenia, said Alan Johnson. So we have these, the politicians suddenly knowing more about science and the scientists. And this was a particularly interesting statement, because as I, I will show you the cannabis data subsequently, but when he was questioned in the Commons as to why he sacked me uh, and why he, he was reclassifying cannabis from C to B, he said, in the face of the ACMD having recommended it stay as class C, he said, well, he had talked to a prison governor who had told him categorically that cannabis caused schizophrenia. Therefore, the ACMD had got it wrong. And, and that is the nature of evidence gathering that in some most aspects of the politics. And then, as I say, if I standing up to that kind of uh, knowledge base isn't good for your health. So let's just go back to a bit of science then. What, how can we educate people about the harms of drugs? So let's start from first principles. What is a drug? And who says? Well, this is a useful definition of a drug, um, something a politician once used but now regrets. And Jackie, I don't know, she wasn't at Somerville, was she? I don't know where she was here, but she obviously forced herself. Um, and David, David struggled, and he, he won't tell you what he did, but I know, and I'll share that with you at the end, so don't slip out before then. <laughs> Some politicians are quite honest, and I like Tim Yeo has a great... So, um, does, he, has a, he likes a lot of things, particularly women, but he also likes cannabis. But this is the truth. The real decision-making is made by the drinks industry. The, the drinks industry do not want you to believe that alcohol is a drug. And in fact, we did a survey when I did a panorama program a few years ago on drugs, and they asked the population, you know, is alcohol a drug? And I think about 60% said no. And when they said to them, well, why isn't it a drug if it makes you intoxicated and sick, etc. And they said, well, if it was a drug, it would be illegal, wouldn't it? And, and that, that argument is one we will come back to, because it's, uh, it, it pervades the whole debate. 
And some of the media agree. Some of the media, this is the Metro, as you know, an offshoot of the Mail. They see alcohol and cigarettes as worse than drugs, but not drugs, whereas the broadsheets, by and large, get it right. And this is an important front page, because these two front pages came out in 2007. And they say exactly what I said in 2009. And I didn't get sacked for saying it then, I suppose because I wasn't chairman then, I was just head of the technical committee. But I think perhaps part of the issue was the proximity to the election. Obviously, I should take a bit more care as to, to when I say what. So what do I say? Well, I say a drug is a chemical which, when taken, produces physiological changes. And in the context of the discussion we're having, it's changes in the brain, usually desirable or beneficial effects. But of course, sometimes drugs produce damaging effects. And, and here are two very illustrative examples of the dangers of drugs. The right-hand side is Leah Betts. Now, has anyone not seen that image? So a few of the younger ones haven't seen that image, and the one from other countries, yes. This is the most famous image of someone having taken a drug. Leah Betts died um, on her 18th birthday. She took probably 80 milligrams, two ecstasy tablets, eight, 40 milligrams each. And her parents had told her that if she took ecstasy, she should drink a lot of water because there had been some deaths in clubs of people dying of over, um, dehydration and overheating with ecstasy. So she took the ecstasy tablets, was, got a bit nervous, and started drinking. And she drank about seven liters of water, and she died of water poisoning. And that's the image of her in intensive care. And that was plastered all over billboards in Britain with the, the sign above it, sorted. And it turns out that that was support drinks industry put that out as a health education message. On the other left-hand side is a, a, a more recent death, Gavin Britton. He's a student from Exeter University, died a couple of years ago after uh, playing a golf match against another university. He engaged in the drinking game. He lost, and he lost his life. Uh, the person who sold Leah Betts, the two ecstasy tablets, got six months in prison. The friends that killed him by making him, through peer pressure, drink the alcohol that killed him, nothing happened to them. Hopefully their conscience has changed their behavior. And I think this is a really fundamental question for institutions like this university. Pe students die because they drink too much in games like this. They should be banned, and they certainly shouldn't be drinking subsidized alcohol in, an, in, in these kind of exercises. And that's something that colleges here can do something about. Now, of course, there's many, many deaths from acute alcohol poisoning. Amy's is probably the most famous, the most recent one. Uh, where she took, drank five and a half, she, her blood alcohol levels five and a half times the driving limit. And uh, I, I think we can say if she had died of a drug, everyone assumed she died taking a drug, i.e. a new recreational drug. If that had happened, there would have been enormous consternation. She dies because she gets too drunk, uh, probably because she's lost her tolerance. And there's not a public outcry to ban alcohol. There's just sort of commiseration with the family. And alcohol is a very dangerous drug. It kills about three young people a week just from poisoning. About 10 of them die of accidents from intoxication. And you, very often they die in their birthdays, which is pro very problematic to the families. And one of the reasons we've always argued that cannabis is safer than uh, alcohol is that you cannot die of cannabis overdose. And in fact, it usually reduces your um, risk taking when you drive, so you rarely causes accidents. And the other point, and the ACMD did a very thorough review of date rape in 2004, and we came to the conclusion that half of all date rape is, is just alcohol, and half is alcohol plus something else. It's almost, there's almost never date rape in which alcohol hasn't either contributed or maybe been the main cause. And so alcohol is clearly the most dangerous drug to young women, as you can see from those images. And there's another myth I want to just share with you, and it's the myth that if people take other drugs, particularly psychedelics, they will do crazy things like fly, try to fly and jump out of windows. I've never managed to find the test case. I think it was probably concocted by the CIA. But there is that myth. And yet, we know that more people die of alcohol-related falls than probably ever have died of psychedelic-related falls. I was in Mallorca a few months ago, and they told me that a person a week dies in the holiday season, trying to jump from a balcony into a swimming pool or between balconies. So alcohol disinhibits people, disrupts judgment, and kills people, prodigious numbers, through falling. But we don't talk about that at all, even 
well, we've talked about this one, but, uh, but mostly we just ignore it. That's just the price we pay for having a good time. This is an image from Scotland. Scotland is suffering a huge uh, problem from drunkenness and violence. A lot of it um, facilitated by this drink, Buckfast wine. This is a wine, about a 12% wine, which has a huge amount of caffeine in it. And what people do is they drink the bottle and then they break the end of the bottle and they've got a good weapon to go fighting. And uh, there is a serious discussion in Scotland now to make, make it so that Buckfast wine is only sold in plastic bottles. And here's another example. This is the other end of the social spectrum. This is a battle at Ascot this summer. Um, alcohol fueled. And you see the bottom left. The champagne bottles are particularly effective weapons and very dangerous if you hit people with them. Even more dangerous than plastic table legs. So alcohol does cause in a prodigious amount of violence. And most domestic violence, most child abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse is also alcohol driven. And some of you may know this, but this is data, recent data, the WHO is showing that globally now alcohol is the biggest cause of disability in the world. And if you look on the left hand side, the males with the green bars is far and away the biggest cause of disability in young men. Women suffer problems like um, lack of contraception and anemia, but even when you collate, collapse the men and women, alcohol is the biggest problem in young people in the world today more than malaria, tuberculosis, meningitis. And here's very recent data. A month ago, European Brain Council ECMP data on the disabilities, uh, disability adjusted life years in Europe. Bottom left, the blue bars, men, the largest daily burden in Europe in men is caused by alcohol. In women, it's in a polar depression. <laughs> So alcohol, massive problem. And you've s probably seen these data. There's, in 1995-6, there were 94,000 hospital admissions. That's gone up in 2006-07 to 208,000. And last year, we had a million hospital episodes of, due to alcohol, of which 13,000 were under the age of 18. Well, for MDMA, ecstasy-like drugs, it was about 2,000. Cannabis, about 700. So these are orders of magnitude difference. And here is the reason why we have a, a growth in alcohol-related harm, particularly health harm. This shows the increased consumption of alcohol going back from the 1950s to the, near the present day. The dotted line is 1971, which is where I'm, I, I can show you we have the data for cannabis to compare. And you see there's a big surge in use from in the early 70s, and that was when we started selling booze outside pubs. And then there was another big rise from 98 onwards. And the blue line shows the affordability of alcohol. Alcohol has got twice as affordable in the last 20 years. And that's largely dr driven by Arco Pops and these super strength lagers. And this is perhaps the most chilling data of all. So this shows the standardized mortality rates for a range of different reasons for dying. Road traffic accidents, stroke, heart attacks, etc. You can see in the last 40 years, they've all gone down. Some have gone down by 60%. The only one that hasn't gone down is liver disease, and liver disease has increased by 250%. So there's an epidemic of deaths. Within 10 years, liver disease will kill more people in this country than heart disease. Extremely expensive illness to treat if you're thinking about liver transplants. And no one is really doing anything about it other than drinking away their memories or their consciousness. It also has huge environmental impacts. Before the Gulf oil spill, the biggest environmental disaster in the world was the Exxon Valdez, when the captain was drunk and just drove this super tanker into the coast of Alaska, wiping out a few thousand miles of coastline um, fauna and flora. And perhaps the worst political damage was done to the Polish government last year, was it last year or the year before? No, last year, when they tried, to, they were going to celebrate liberation, they were flying to the Ukraine, a celebration. It was foggy. The pilot didn't want to land. The head of the Air Force, who was drunk, said, you're going to land. Well, they landed, but it was a bit short of the runway, so they're all dead. So the whole parliament wiped out in one air crash. 
quite directly related to drunkenness. And we know in our political lifetime, George Brown, who's of my era, and Charles Kennedy, who's of your era, they're both talented politicians whose careers had, have asymptoted it because of the, uh, their drink problem. Now, what about cannabis? Well, this is Alan Johnson. This is the man who sacked me. I'm the, one of those guys in the spliff there with the moustache. Um, and it is harmful, particularly in, if you try to engage in a sensible debate about it. <laughs> we, um, three times in the, the ten years I served on the council, we were asked to review cannabis. This is the third report in 2008 where we were asked to review cannabis and find reasons why it should be class B. And we failed to find those reasons, and I'll tell you why. So here is what's happened in terms of cannabis use over the last 40 years. So remember, alcohol use had gone up two times, twice as much. Cannabis use has gone up 20 times in the last 40 years. The fear has been, and the fear that still hangs over many people's uh, view of cannabis is it causes schizophrenia. Well, we showed that there is no increase in schizophrenia, either prevalence or incidence or psychosis. And that's true in the UK, and as far as we know, that's true in every Western country where there again has been this massive increase in cannabis use. You cannot find a country in the world where that has translated into any measurable impact on the prevalence of schizophrenia. We estimated that there probably is an effect, it's a small effect, and to stop one person developing schizophrenia because of cannabis, you have to stop 5,000 young men or 7,000 young women from ever smoking. So it's a completely meaningless public health goal, and it's certainly nothing you could potentially attack using criminal sanctions. And we said, there is not a problem, you don't need to reclassify it. But there was enormous desire to reclassify. And this is what the Home Secretary at the time said. We make, we'll make it Class B because of possible risk, public perception, and policy priorities. Sorry, policing priorities. Sorry, they're probably the same, actually. Yeah. Um, um, and one of the really interesting questions, which we haven't yet had answered, is whether that a deal was done between Gordon Brown and the Daily Mail. It is rumoured that he met Paul Dacre when he was going to go to the country just after he took over the, the premiership and, and a deal was struck where the, where the Daily Mail, a newspaper which has never in the history of the world supported the Labour Party, would support the Labour Party if Gordon Brown did three things. I don't know what the other two were, but I am told that the third one was he would reclassify cannabis. If you want to know the, the true scale of drug harms, look at this. So on the left-hand side, you see the number of deaths from tobacco, alcohol, and opiates. So 80,000 a year from tobacco, about 7,000 a year from alcohol, about 1,000 a year from opiates. And then on the right-hand side, you see the other drugs. You see paracetamol, 200, cocaine, about 150, and then you see cannabis, methadone, and ecstasy down at the bottom here. So the disproportionate burden in terms of mortality is through tobacco and with alcohol second and opiates third. So the drugs that we are exercised about, or the government's exercised about, cannabis and ecstasy cause virtually no harm despite very widespread use. And that was why when we did this second Lancet paper, published that last year, alcohol came out on top. This graph shows the harms to the individual in blue and the harms to society in red. And it's using a technique, a sophisticated technique called multi-criteria decision analysis, where you can essentially compare and aggregate different sorts of harms. And you can see alcohol came out on top, and then heroin, crack cocaine, with tobacco, and then cannabis lower down. So those are the scientific facts. Let's look a bit at the politics now. I've already touched on this, but I just want to share with you the, the way in which drugs are controlled in this country is through the Misuse of Drugs Act. And that was set up in 1971 specifically to stop politics getting in the way of rational decision-making on drugs. Jim Callaghan was the Home Secretary who set it up, and he reasoned a bit like the way, same way that Gordon Brown reasoned. One of the best things he did was to take interest rates out of Parliament and give them to the Bank of England. 
Well, Callaghan said, it, drugs are too, too much, uh, they're too appealing to politicians as a quick hit, so let's, get, let's give it to the experts. Let's set up a committee called the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, and we'll let them decide on the harms of drugs, and they will then recommend the classification of drugs, and w government will then decide on the penalties for misuse within each class. So they've set up the three classes, A, B, and C. And the government is l constitutionally obliged to consult with the committee uh, before uh, uh, changing, putting a drug in or taking a drug out or changing it. And it actually worked very well. It worked so well that in um, about 1992, the ACMD went to Margaret Thatcher. And so for those of you from other places, she was a prime minister at the time. And um, she had a reputation for being the Iron Lady and not for turning. And they went to her and they said, we're going to have an epidemic of AIDS from intravenous drug use. The only way we can stop it is by providing needle exchange. And she said, well, Tories don't do needle exchange. And they said to her, well, you have a choice. You know, you either do needle exchange or AIDS, which would you prefer to be remembered by? <laughs> and she said, okay, you're the scientists. If you tell us needle exchange will work, we will do it. And, and this may be the only time in her life she did, a t she did turn. But she was right, because we brought in needle exchange, and Britain led the world in terms of the... the, the, the uh, starting to shut down the rise in AIDS. Um, we became a paradigm case. Many other countries then brought in the same kind of um, health-promoting procedures based on our, our behavior. It was, a, it was a, a remarkably effective piece of um, intervention. Now, subsequently, we've had another prime minister. That's uh, Tony Blair on the left and W on the right. And um, strange things happened after the war in Iraq because because Tony decided that he could win wars, and Iraq was easy, so he'd now take on drugs, possibly encouraged by George, who'd been fighting the drug war for some time. Um, and the war on drugs started with the mushrooms, magic mushrooms. The magic mushrooms were legal in this country in 2005, and then the Labour Party decided they wanted to make them illegal. It's not entirely clear why. We heard they were trying to do this, and we said to them, but by the way, you do know you cannot possibly have a debate on this without consulting the ACMD. That's what the law says. And they said, oh, um, we, can, you know, we can blow up Iraq, but we can't, we've got to consult with you on changing the law on mushrooms. Anyway, yeah, well, that's the law. So on a Tuesday night, we got an email saying, we're thinking of, well, we have a debate on Thursday. We're going to change the law on mushrooms. What do you think, ACMD? And we said, it's completely inappropriate to expect us to come to a decision on a topic like this in 36 hours. So we said we will not we were not engaged in this silliness. And they went ahead and they made mushrooms uh, a class A drug alongside crack cocaine and heroin. And that was really the beginning of the end for any kind of logic in the drug debate. And um, there were two messages from that. Um, and the one is that the first casualty of war is the truth. If you wage a war, you lie. And the lie was that mushrooms are highly dangerous when they're not. As far as we know, they're not dangerous at all. And then, of course, once at war, all reason is treason. And I didn't know this at the time, but now I understand. In the end, that's why I got sacked, because if you, if you continue banging on about something in the face of in war situations, it becomes treason. And uh, maybe, you know, it's, if I'd had a better education, maybe if I'd been an undergraduate here and not Cambridge, I'd have actually known these aphorisms. So there's a real conundrum about cannabis. About half the young people use it. There's very few experienced health harm. There's very little harm to society. The government policy of, of using criminal sanctions against cannabis criminalizes a lot of people who will not come to harms. So we're, we're going to criminalize you for your own good, just in case. It ruins future prospects. You can't become a doctor. I don't even know if you, be, um, you can't become a lawyer. You know, it, it severely impacts on your career. And it denies access of cannabis for treatment. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And the question that's always been on my mind is, is this a just approach? to a non-problem. And it happened. This was Jackie Smith's legacy. She encouraged the police through incentives uh, to, in, to, to start criminalizing people, catching people with cannabis. We had sniffer, illegally, we had sniffer dogs at tube stations in London. 
breaching human rights, but taking people that look like they might have cannabis, sniffing them and then arresting them. So she did it, she succeeded. We got 158,000 um, arrests in 2007, up from 88,000. It was a very effective way of um, pretending the police were doing something useful. It, of course, it was completely unjust, not it was un only unjust in principle, it was unjust in practice because we saw this very high over-representation of ethnic minorities in terms of the arrests. And then they started arresting people using the drug for medicinal purposes. I just want to dwell on this because I think this is probably the lowest point of the last government in relation to any kind of principled public stance. Cannabis is the oldest medicine in the world. It, we've got evidence going back for 4,000 years. It was licensed, available in this country till 1971 when two GPs started prescribing cannabis tincture to their patients and suggesting that they put it on cigarettes, dried it out and smoked it. And the government, instead of saying, what well, you would think a rational government would do, would say, well, that's a bad thing to do, doctors. We're going to strike you off the medical register. They said, oh, why don't we just strike the drug off the pharmaceutical register? So it ceased to become a medicine in 1971. And yet it's got a tremendous history in the UK. Uh, the Queen Victoria's... Um, a physician, Russell Reynolds, wrote a treatise on the medicinal value of cannabis, and she was a, an exemplar of people who benefited. She used it for her period pains. She used it to deal with the pains of pregnancy. She wrote extolling its virtues as a medicine. I sometimes wonder if the reason she has so many children is she used it at other times as well, but I'm not sure about that. Um, that was then. A hundred years later, we have this. This is a true story. This is a teacher with multiple sclerosis, wheelchair bound, three times in the last few years, the police have done dawn raids on her house, smashed her door down. It's not as if she can run away. She's in a wheelchair. Why do they do it? Well, they do it because, of course, when you wage a war, it gives you a license to do dangerous, damaging things. People like to battle. You know, war is about uh, losing self-control, and that's why they do it. And she walked, she's had three convictions. If they do it again, she'll go to prison, because that's what the law says these days. And there is no defense, there is no defense. She cannot say, I need it, because it's the only thing that helps my spasticity. And why can't she say that? Because that used to be the medical defense. In English common law, you could always argue that if you had to do something, because it's the only way you could escape from interminable pain or danger, then you could use that to argue, defend yourself in court. That was the law of necessity, the defense of necessity. And in 2005, the law lords decided that that was no longer allowed for cannabis. So you could still argue that your crack use was necessary or your heroin use, but for cannabis, that is no longer a defense. So if you're caught, you're convicted. There is no way out. If they get you, you, you are convicted of cannabis possession. And they can seize your assets. And they, I get emails regularly, people who have their partner growing the cannabis, they get, the police come in, they arrest the multiple sclerosis sufferer for, for possession, and they arrest the partner for dealing. That's dealing up to potentially 14 years in prison. They seize the assets of both, create enormous havoc to that family to protect them, of course, for the dangers of cannabis. And the law lords that denied the defense were Bingham, Carswell, and Roger. And this is their, part of their judgment, which is, I think, truly offensive to any sort of free-thinking person in this country. The court, that's those three, were influenced by the government's refusal to relax the legislation in this context, despite recommendations to do so by the House of Lords Select Committee. So a very famous committee on cannabis recommended le loosening the laws on cannabis. The government rejected it, and the law laws therefore decided the government must have been right. That's the... Um, the, the, um, the, the, the explanation of their decision there. And if you want to read a bit more about it, there's my blog, um, which goes into it in more detail. But what is particularly offensive is not that they did it, but what they said before. So this is what Bingham said in 2002 when interviewed by Boris Johnson for The Spectator. When he became a law lord, Johnson spoke with him, and, and Johnson asked him this question. So you would legalize cannabis? And he said, absolutely, it's stupid having a law which isn't doing what it's there for. So two years before, he denied access to cannabis to people with 
multiple sclerosis, he was recommending making the cannabis legal. And if ever there was any, either he had a, uh, some kind of Damascene moment, he suddenly realized that cannabis was very different to what it's ever been, or he was just pressured by the government to do it. I think you know, that as a, that's an indictment on the independence of our judiciary. Now, what about the media? I said the media, I put the media in my title here, and I, I just want to say a few words about the way they distort the debate. This is one of the most brilliant PhDs I've ever seen. This is a, a Scottish uh, student, Alistair, who looked at every single re coroner's report in Scotland in the 1990s, and then he looked at the, the ones that had a drug associated with the death, and then he went to see, were those reported in the newspapers? And there were, there were 2,255 cases, of which 546 were in the newspapers. So one in four deaths with a drug other, uh, other than alcohol involved get in the newspapers. But there's enormous distortion. If you die of paracetamol poisoning, you've got a one in 265 chance of having that mentioned in the newspapers. If you die of ben uh, morphine poisoning, it's, or if you die with morphine in your blood, it's one in 72. They're not interested in that. They're more interested in amphetamines, only 20, 36 deaths, but one in three get reported. Uh, cocaine, one in eight. Heroin, one in 16, uh, one in five. Methadone, one in 16. But the one that they really love to report is ecstasy. Now, there were 28 deaths in the 10 years Likelihood is that probably a third of them actually were caused by ecstasy, but everyone got reported. And that's why the people, the public, think ecstasy is a dangerous drug, because that's what they read about. And of course, often they're young, attractive women, so there's lots of pictures in the paper as well. And that distortion of, of, of evidence is one of the real problems we have with the media. And we saw it, we saw it two years ago with methadrone. Dead teen took party drug. So this is in the sun, and the son reporting that a neighbor of hers had said she had taken this drug plus ecstasy. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you, neighbor. She died of bronchopneumonia. But when you search the web for methadrone deaths, you find Gabby. It's still there as a death from methadrone, not that she died of bronchopneumonia. And you kind of think, well, maybe that wasn't a very helpful comment that the neighbor made. Because if the paramedics thought she was, she was actually uh, intoxicated rather than ill, maybe they didn't give her quite the same attention as they would have done. You know? I mean, it's been known for people to ignore uh, individuals in A&E who are drunk or un under intoxication. And it was very offensive to her mother. She was branded a druggie, but she was just a little girl who died. I don't know, maybe her phone was tapped. We'll have to find out. And this, is, this was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. I was... Uh, in Barcelona, in a taxi, going to give a lecture, and I got a phone call from CNN. And the reason they had my phone number is because I'd done an interview on methadrone the week before. And he said, where's Scunthorpe? I said, what? <laughs> Where is Scunthorpe? I said, why do you want to go to Scunthorpe? Because the Humberside police are having an international press conference to report the deaths of two people from methadrone. I said, that's absurd. There's no way two people are going to... You know, no deaths from methadrone yet. And as far as we know, there's almost been none in the history of the drug. So how could there be two deaths in, in, in Scunthorpe? So I said, well, anyway, go up the M1, four hours, turn right. <laughs> I don't know if they made it, but if they had made it, they would have heard the dad, they would have heard Nick's dad weeping. I don't want him to be labelled a druggie because he wasn't. Just an, on a night out with his friends, enjoying himself, a normal, caring, hard-working lad. Um, interesting. So these lads had gone out on a Sunday night. They'd gone to about seven bars. They had drunk a huge amount of alcohol. About three in the morning, they wandered off. We think they probably were looking for methadrone. Unfortunately, they were giving methadone, which is very toxic in combination with alcohol, and they died. But this was the reason people started to want to ban methadrone, because the police were saying it was killing people, even though they hadn't, people hadn't taken it at all. And the forensics confirm that. And this was the last supposed methadrone death uh, from a girl in, um, in Newcastle. And she hadn't taken methadrone either. And her mother said, all the speculation it was methadrone must have been lies. But I was totally convinced. And you might say, well, so what? You know, okay, so 
is there any reason why you should not ban nephrodrone? It might possibly. Let's use the precautionary principle that politicians love. So anyway, it got banned, even though, as far as we know, it hadn't killed anyone. But then when we look in hindsight, we see that there may have been some benefits of mephedrone, because it was a relatively weak stimulant. I mean, basically, a gram of mephedrone is equivalent to, say, 250 milligrams of cocaine and maybe 30 milligrams of methamphetamine. So it's actually, if you take all what you've got, it's much less likely to kill you than if you've got a gram of cocaine or a gram of meth uh, uh, methamphetamine. So, in fact, we discovered that there was a big fall in cocaine deaths. The first time in, we've been recording them that cocaine deaths fell, and that was because people switched. They switched to a safer drug. A, lo a lot fewer soldiers got kicked out of the army because they switched and didn't test positive for cocaine. So that saved quite a few soldiers. I mean, obviously, they're going to be made redundant soon, but anyway, at least they're not being drummed out and they keep their pensions. There was 600,000 import duty. And what's going to happen now? Well, what we know is now the price has gone up threefold and the use hasn't changed at all. So we've just made a lot of dealers richer. Uh, and we'll have to see what happens next year, whether cocaine use rises. But then I started thinking, could this be true of other drugs? Maybe some other drugs we ban might have uses. Maybe there are per perverse negative consequences of banning drugs. And I, I came up with this one. This is, one. this is a very Cambridge one, though, of course. It's... Um, Crick and uh, Watson on the left-hand side there, discovering the double helix, which um, Crick explains came to him as, a, as a, an insight when he was taking LSD. That was when it was legal. It was perfectly reasonable. He, if, that's what people were doing. And then Kerry Mullis, who discovered PCR. So the two most important discoveries in medicine in the last century came about when people were taking LSD. And Kerry unquestionably says, I would never have had the insight if I hadn't taken LSD. And you could argue that, in addition to cannabis, uh, there are uses of many drugs which are banned. Ecstasy, MDMA for trauma therapy, psilocybin for depression, LSD for terminal illness, etc. And mephedrone was being developed as part of a program for finding drugs to treat addiction. And now it's been banned. Companies will never work in that field again. And I just want to show you a bit of our research, which caused some of you may have seen on the TV last year. This looks at the... Um, shutting down of the brain by psilocybin. And psilocybin shuts down a part of the brain called the default mode network, but it particularly shuts down that lowest blue blob. And that's the part of the brain where we think depression comes from. So one of the reasons people mood gets elevated on psilocybin may be that you switch off that brain. And, and many treatments for depression switch off that part of the brain. So maybe this is an interesting target for an innovative target for treating depression. So we made the TV program that showed this. And then the next week, with under parliamentary privilege, uh, one of the more, most regressive MPs we have, Jim Dobbin, said, why was Professor Nutt allowed to use an illegal drug in a scientific study? And that begins to get to the nub of the issue, that people, illegality distorts people's thinking. This is why we're interested in illegal drugs. This is a recent study by Mitthofer showing that on the right-hand side, Two psychotherapy sessions under an MDMA, ecstasy, can produce a profound, enduring, res positive response in people with resistant PTSD. It could be a hugely useful therapy, but almost impossible to give, because if you, you can't get permission to give it, you can't buy it legally. So it's hugely difficult to work uh, with these kind of drugs. But the media don't just have it down on recreational drugs. I thought it was appropriate in the context of Monica to say something about their down on antidepressants. And this was a statement in the uh, Independent in 2008, Jeremy Lawrence, antidepressants don't work. And it came from this study, and it was an announced with a press release said, saying, antidepressants don't work, except in small print in severe cases. But of course, the newspapers didn't report the small print. And then there was a book antidepressants, the emperor's new drugs. So there's a big, there's a business, a big business of knocking antidepressants, you know, the front page of Newsweek. And the media said that, that Kirsch was right, that drugs don't work, and we should use placebos instead. And in fact, we should use psychotherapy. Well, I haven't got time to deconstruct all the myths there, but I'll just say a couple of things. Here's his data, so showing that antidepressants only work in the green bit, the higher end, the more severe end of depression. But in fact, his data are rather distorted because he normalized them. And he also used drugs which no longer are used, like nefazodone. 
In fact, if you take out that banned drug, his analysis was wrong anyway, and drugs do work. And so you wonder, why did he put it in? A weak drug that's no longer available. And also, he used uh, a measure which would inevitably work against finding an effect in the less severe, because he used a fixed change in the Hamilton. And he changed the statistics there. And there was a very, very nice analysis by an Oxford um, postdoc, Jamie Horder, published last year, showing how they had distorted the data to get the answer that they wanted. And in fact, if you use the normalized data, you see, in fact, there is no uh, lessening of the placebo effect with more severe depression. It did kick the regulators into action. The regulators were obviously very up worried because maybe they'd been getting it wrong all these years, and they, they went back and reanalyzed their data. And they actually showed that antidepressants work, whether you have low depression on the left or severe depression on the right, the difference between the drug effect up at 50% responders and the placebo rate at about 30% responders is a very clear effect across every level of severity. So drugs do work. And when I said to Jeremy Lawrence, why did you write that rubbish about SSRIs, antidepressants not working? He said, yeah, I know it's bad, wasn't it? My mother's on Prozac and she's done really well. And here's the data for each of the individual drugs. They all work and they work if you use the right measure, which is response rates. They all work very well. And you should use a better measure. You shouldn't just use the immediate response to drugs. You should use the ability of drugs to prevent relapse. And this is the work of Geddes and colleagues in this room doing a meta-analysis showing that antidepressants preventing relapse are one of the most powerful drug effects in medicine, the number needed to treat of about three. And virtually nothing, not even surgery, has got that good. And here's an example. Here's, this is the classic study that started us thinking about how to protect, protect people against depression. Imipramine, they've been on it for three years before they go into the trial. They stay on it for another two years, the pink blobs, and they stay well. One relapses. After three years of being well, the half are switched to placebo, and you see within a year, two-thirds have relapsed. And antidepressants protect against stress and relapse, and that's their powerful use. Um, for depression. So let me just get to the end of my talk now by asking this question, how harmful should a drug be before it's banned? I've always argued that alcohol as a popular dangerous drug might be the yardstick and I've written a paper about that. The other E is ethanol, by the way, for those of you. But this is the other possibility. Should things that are more dangerous or less dangerous than horse riding be banned? And I thought about this because I saw a woman uh, in my clinic who had fallen off a horse, smashed her frontal lobes, became very disinhibited. They took her children away. She lost her job, and she came to see me seeking help. I put her on amphetamine, amphetamine sulfate, an illegal drug, because sometimes it helps control behavioral disturbance in the brain damaged. It helped her a bit, but it was never going to rebuild the smashed up brain. And I started doing some research on how common horse riding damage it was, and I discovered it causes a lot of deaths and spinal transactions, etc. And even kryptonite or large amounts of money do not stop people who, from dying as a consequence of breaking your back when you fall off your horse. And I wondered whether it was addictive. And uh, this is a very interesting description of an addiction. But those who do it, do, it, do so because it's a passion, a thrill a love affair, because it brings that sense of being alive, properly alive. In a way, there's an implicit contract with the devil. You know it's dangerous, but you're willing to accept and suffer the consequences. Now, that could be, that could be a lot of things, but it, um, it certainly could be drugs, and it certainly could be horse riding. And here she is, the woman who wrote that. This is the woman who wrote that after she'd fallen off a horse, broken her neck and her back, will be almost certainly a paraplegic for the rest of her life. And she's, there she is. Um, and this is a description of withdrawal. She's, she gets a withdra she, this is a withdrawal reaction from horse riding. Part of me yearns to be close to a horse, to bury my face in its neck and inhale that smell. But the sense of loss that will come with that is terrifying. So I think horse riding is addictive as well as dangerous. And that's why I came up with this syndrome, the equine addiction syndrome, uh, equacy. And I thought this was one of the neatest things I've ever written because it really did make people think. And if you compare horse riding and ecstasy, you see there are benefits or disbenefits of each. Um, some are 
many, most measures, ecstasy is safer than equacy. I'm particularly interested in the green one, the methane. And as I say to people, it's much easier to, to police equacy because you can never smuggle a horse into a club. <laughs> and of course, there's another, there's another aspect to this, and I don't want to belabor you too much, but about a thousand horses die and that died in the last five years in entertaining humans. Now, I published that paper, and um, three days later, I got a phone call from the Home Secretary in the very same room as I'd seen the woman with the brain damage. And we had a little dialogue. She was obviously not very happy. And I tried to sort of get it back onto my terms, like a kind of reason and evidence. And this is the conversation, as I recall, we got to. You can't compare harms from illegal activity with an illegal one. Why not? Because one's illegal. Why is it illegal? Because it's harmful. Don't we need to compare harms to determine if it should be illegal? I put the things in. Um, you can't compare harms with legal activity to an illegal one. And then she wandered off to the commons to berate me and tried to deflect us criticism from her for, for having her primary home as her sister's small bedroom. It didn't work. The political commentators saw through it and that she were quite supportive of me. But this, I discovered, is the way most politicians think. If it's illegal, you cannot think logically about it. And, oh, have I lost the picture? No. And then, this is Alan Johnson showing his um, evidence uh, and reason. This is what he said when he sacked me. I was big enough, strong enough, bold enough to sack that. Now, I don't know, maybe he, maybe he did want to be Shadow Chancellor after all. I don't know why he was posturing himself for that, but anyway. But he wasn't big enough to tell the truth about drugs, nor to deal with police corruption when he knew that the police were in the pay of the news of the world. And he knew about phone hacking. But he wouldn't take on the media, because they were, maybe they got something on him, I don't know. From, <laughs> but he was quite happy to sack me for standing up to, for science. Actually, though, I actually think the media were really the, uh, underneath it all. So this is what the Times said. When the Yves Savile lecture was published, the Times said, government policy derided by its own drugs advisor. And I think many people in the Home Office thought this was a horse-riding analogy. <laughs> and then I want to just finish by talking about public opinion. Because one of the saddest things about the whole cannabis debacle was that the drugs minister, who was called Alan Campbell, he said to me, look, we cannot keep cannabis as class C because the public don't want it. The public want it class B. And we, I said to him, well, that's a very strange thing because in our report, we published the result of a Mori poll, which we, did to, which we asked them that question. And here is the data. Two-thirds of the population wanted cannabis to be class C or less. So as many people wanted no penalty as wanted B or A together. So the public, so I said, look, this is the public. The Murray poll is the general public. It's what you based your election procedures on. Why don't you believe this? And he said, well, that's the one kind of public. They don't read the Daily Mail. So what can we do? Well, you'll be pleased to know I'm going to shut up quite soon. But I think there are a few things we can do. We're going to we should eliminate the old rhetoric. We should get politicians to tell the truth. Well, certainly when they're in power. We should educate the public. We should challenge the media. And we should try some innovative, non-criminal approaches to drug use, such as they do in countries like the Netherlands and Portugal. I'll just show you a few examples of that. So this is the rhetoric. The drug rhetoric hasn't changed an iota in a hundred years. 1916, we must stamp out the evil of cocaine. And in 2010, we must stamp out the evil of methadrone. I mean, come on, guys, you know, just try to, try to, let's at least have a debate that's in modern terms. I mean, the concept of a drug as being evil, that is just, that it's beyond primitive. I mean, it's actually deliberately misleading any kind of rational sense, sensitive discussion. We could do with a bit of political integrity. So Bob Ainsworth was a drug minister before Alan Campbell. And he did nothing uh, until he stood down. And then he said, uh, well, I got it wrong, guys, sorry. As a drugs minister for the Home Office, I saw the, that 
how prohibition fails to reduce the harms that drugs cause in the UK, fueling burglaries, gifting the trade to gangsters, and increasing HIV. So as soon as he stood, stood down, he told people what he thought. I mean, bizarre politicians won't do that. I mean, one of the most interesting discussions I had was, was with Alan, um, Alan Campbell. I said, well, you know, what, you can stand up for what you believe in. You don't have to go with what the male, you know, and he said, well, I'm not sure. And he said, well, what about the death penalty? I mean, you actually, you know, the, most of the public want to hang people, but you don't allow them to do that. So why don't you stand up for rationality and drugs? And there's no answer, of course. And then, of course, there's this very interesting experimental approach to how you deal with cannabis in a non non-criminal way. So this is David Cameron on the left, Joss Astor on the right, two very privileged people from uh, privileged backgrounds going to an expensive school called Eton. And um, they engaged in a fascinating experiment. They, they got interested in um, reggae, or so they said, and that allowed them to go and buy records in the east end of London and bring back some brown stuff in brown bags. Um, and they were caught smoking cannabis in, in Eton and because he'd only smoked, but he hadn't sold, Cameron was kept on. What they did with, to him was a really interesting model. They fined him. They gated him. Couldn't go to the tea shop at Saturdays. And they gave him a Georgic, which is copying out hundreds of lines of Latin. And I think that was probably an interesting deterrent. I don't know what they made him copy out. I wonder, I thought this might be perhaps what you did. I don't know. <laughs> he won't tell us, unfortunately. Um, they expelled seven boys, suspended five, gated four. It was an interesting experiment because Astor, as you know, is even more privileged than Cameron, and he had a real problem. He was expelled from school, and he's ended up having a number of convictions, mostly for, for cocaine. Whereas David went from being the most difficult boy I ha have ever taught, that's the headmaster's words, to, of course, David C., the progressive MP. And when he was first in, in Parliament, he was very sensible. He argued against the Home Secretary, Howard, who wanted to ban raves, not least because his girlfriend was going to them. And, and she still does. She was in Ibiza, you remember, last, this summer. And he was very sensible about ecstasy. He said it should not be Class A. And in fact, he said that the drug laws were rubbish and we should completely revise them. But things change when you lead the Tory party, so he shortened his name from David to Dave, and, but he became slightly more aggressive. He retracted his views on ecstasy the day after he took on the uh, leadership of the Tory party, and now he's bringing in a drugs bill based on the supposition that drug use is a lifestyle choice and not an illness, so we don't actually need doctors and nurses to do with it, you just tell people to snap out and um, do what they did and become politicians, I suppose. It's a, and I just wanted to show you this. I don't know, do they still wear the uniform? Do you still see them? Does the Bullingdon still work? It's a great, I mean, it's a fascinating, fascinating club because, of course, they invented the rave. I mean, you know, the whole point of the Bullingdon Club was to get away from the oppressive nature of Oxford and go a few miles out of town and get drunk and do other things over the weekends and then come back and be students again. So Bullingdon is the original ravers. And... Um, that's lifestyle choice, I would consist. I mean, when you think of the price of that outfit, it's, uh, you've got to have a certain lifestyle to afford it. And drug addiction isn't a lifestyle choice. Drug addiction is something that people get into, usually not wanting to, and certainly not able to get out of. So, they sacked me. They didn't shut me up. I set up an independent committee, uh, the ISCD. Seven of the other scientists on the ASCMD resigned in sympathy, and they joined the committee. We have a a fantastic group of, uh, of expertise. We're supported by the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies. We have a website, drugscience.org.uk. If you want to know what I believe the truth about drugs is, you just go on there. And you can read my blogs, which aren't, there's not a lot of them, but they're, I think, they're very targeted and uh, I think also evidence-based because they're referenced. So I'll finish now by uh, sharing with you two, two other quotations. And I sort of naively thought that's what this country was built on, but not yet. Thank you very much.